Hi, I'm Sean Spazito. I'm the Assistant Director for Content Strategy at the Christian Science Modern. Welcome back to Highwire PR's third annual happy hour. Uh, with me, I have Chris Weisopel. You are the CTO and co-founder of Veracode. Jeremiah Grossman, uh, you are the Chief of Security Strategy at Sentinel One now. And Ziv Mador, you are the Vice President of Security Research at Trustwave. I mean, gentlemen, we were talking about the professionalization of the criminal marketplace, specifically as it has to do with ransomware over the past two years. Um, you know, uh, Jeremiah, you've done a lot of research, right? I, I was hoping we could start with you and just seeing, like, how this marketplace has sort of evolved. Uh, the first thing I would look at, it's a well-played number, but just look at the dollars and cents of it. When a ransomware incident occurs, one of the things the FBI encourages people to do was report to the FBI that there was an incident and how much they paid out so they could at least measure the problem. In 2015, over the whole course of the year, the FBI counted roughly $24 million in total ransoms paid out. Yeah. Q1 of 2016, that number ballooned to over $200 million. Yes. Now, we think, if those numbers play out, that's a brand new billion cybercrime market. When you're dealing with those kinds of numbers, you know the bad guys are scaling, and when every time you scale, you have to professionalize. The only question is, what does that really mean? Yeah, so, so Chris, you, you, you look like you really want to chime in. Like, what, what's yeah, your thought? Yeah, I mean, like, obviously, like, the malware market has been professionalized, right? Of I course. Mean, it's been going on for years and years and years, and here we have a brand new market that's only maybe a year, two years old. So it's like startup phase. Yeah. So there's rapid, rapid innovation. Yeah, so when you look at what ransomware is as a marketplace, as an economic endeavor, I wanted to find corollaries, maybe other economic models that we can start to look at trends and how this market might evolve. And the, the one I presented on at RSA, where we're kind of sitting around today, was uh, kidnapping a ransom. The, the crime that's the oldest time. Yeah. And when I was studying uh, kidnapping and ransom, KNR as for short, um, the, cyber, the insurers were paying, were recompensating the victims in form of insurance, and that carried over to cyber insurance. I was like, okay, if cyber insurers are paying back ransoms, they must have an economic model. So I started studying it. So KNR insurance and that marketplace seems to correlate very well with the evolution of ransomware. Sure, sure, Chris. Go yeah, ahead. That, that, that's interesting because if you think about like you know this is this is you know leveraging a lot of the skill sets that are were in the traditional malware market, which is like stealing you know PII and yeah, stealing yeah, passwords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is a little bit different. Like collections are different, right? You're talking about sort of the collections part. There's yeah, this whole aspect, service, right? Right. There's this whole had to be innovations in the collection. How do you how do you get the money from the victim as opposed to collection being monetized by selling in a marketplace? Your PII. Like, that's one of the things that's really kind of changed about this. One of the things I thought was interesting was when you're stealing, like, PII, which was the traditional market, and yeah. monetizing that, or stealing credit card data, monetizing that, you didn't have to present yourself to the victim, yeah. right? It was silent to the victim. Yeah. Now there's this whole presentation layer. Like, they're hiring graphic designers so there's like to R create... Team. Well, they're, they're, they're hiring graphic designers to create a nice presentation to describe what the victim needs to do, it's very professional, step one, step two, it's gotta be very clear. You know, there's actually probably some market research going on, A-B testing, like yeah. how, how, do, how do I present the notice to the user and how to pay? Should I pay through Bitcoin or should I pay through Amazon gift cards or Apple, you know, iTunes cards? Like, there's some real innovation going on. Yeah, they, they have a, a notion of conversion rates. <laughs> yeah, so. conversion rate, right. Yeah. You, you talked about the economy, the underground economy, and what we see is how different groups uh, gain expertise in specific areas, and they just run their business and serve the other groups, right? So the, the, those groups that can generate traffic of victims yeah, yeah, into yeah. the uh, exploit kits or malvertisement that redirect to exploit kits. And the exploit kits are services, underground services that infect people and then they distribute the malware that their other groups pay them to distribute. Yeah. Um, and so that's a part of the professionalism they go through. They don't try to do the whole sequence of infection. They just own the part they do well, and the other groups pay them for that. Yeah, so, I mean, that's interesting, because I think the way we think of, like, traditional businesses, everything is under a single umbrella, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know... There is, you know, like like company A and then company A has customer service and they do the whole thing, right? I mean, are these true businesses or are they just like kind of bands of folks that meet on a forum and then just decide to work together? I mean, how, how, do, how, how does that sort of, how do these guys get together and how do they operate, functionally operate? I think the way to look at it is there's what's happening today and what the market's moving towards. 
right now in the age of ransomware, they're small, loose-knit groups that, that operate project by project. Mm. But as it professionalizes, as it, they form syndicates and everybody has a role. Okay. And the roles get very, very small. Just like Chris said, there's going to be graphic designers and their job is to write the ransomware note. Yeah. There's going to be people that finance the operations, the other ones that just find the exploits. And the one that is the most interesting to me is there's going to be professional negotiators on these things on both sides of the transaction because they need to be English speaking on both ends to yeah. get the payment. Oh, for sure. But that talks back to the, that customer service aspect. I mean, the market has gotten so big that, you know... Yeah, ahead, it, the customer service aspect is really interesting because it's solving a business problem. The business problem is like, I need to make it easy for the customer has. to pay. Yeah. Right? And like real like businesses do that. Like they make it really, like we, we take ATM cards, we take credit cards, we, do, we you know, an online payment, we take PayPal, right? It's like, well, they can't do that here, right? So they're figuring out what's the easiest way for people to pay. And it does seem to be gravitating to a lot around Bitcoin, but on the other hand, Bitcoin's a little harder than telling someone to buy an iTunes card. Oh, of course. So it's a little, it's a little bit back, but that's not as anonymous. Yeah. So I think it's kind of still shaking out a little bit on the payment side. Ziv? Yeah, sure. Um, ransomware is an exception in the malware world in the sense that their reputation actually is very important for them. And not just the reputation in the underground, which is super important for them to make business with other cyber criminals, but their reputation with users like us. Why? Because if people don't trust that they're going to get their files back, they wouldn't pay the ransom. Yeah. So they need to have a reputation. They do that through a couple of ways. First of all, in most cases, they really decrypt the files. Yeah. If they wouldn't do that, people would not pay anymore, right? Anyone can Google and find out that people didn't get their files back. So that's one part of the reputation. But the other part of building their reputation, for example, by demonstrating to the victim that they can really decrypt their Yeah, so it's a them. competitive landscape. I mean, there are a lot. There are a lot of competitors out there. I mean, yeah. has anyone ever done any work, or any research, in kind of quantifying how large, like the or even the number of folks that are that are working on this, or the or the number of groups running command and control servers? I, I know that's hard to do, right? That's a that's a really difficult task. But just maybe a best guess. The we don't. Have, you're right. We don't have much data on and how many people, but we do have a sense of where it originates. And the best research that's available, it's about eighty percent comes out of Russia right now. So it's not the only areas, but you got to look at it more of a global phenomenon. As a malware is all is global, and there's teams yeah, all of course. over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ransomware will get there, but right now we don't know the number of operators, but we know the geo it's coming out of, and that's mostly Russia right now. Mostly Russia, most mostly uh, Eastern Europe. You know, Chris, I want to harken back to something you said earlier. Like you can pay me in Bitcoin, you can pay me in like you know green dot money packs, right? You can pay me in all sorts. Of, you can pay me in all sorts of different ways. I mean. Ransomware has been around since 1989, right? Uh, what what was the catalyst over the past two years, sort of in your opinion, that sort of made this marketplace sort of explode? Yeah, you, you know, I think part of it was is actually uh, better security with the payment systems. That that is actually drying up a little bit as an easy way to steal credit cards because it's actually getting more secure. Okay. Like like when 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 Europe went to you know chip chip and pin EMV, yeah. There, there became more credit card fraud in the United States. Yeah. Because that was the, that was a weak thing. So they're always looking for the best way to monetize. And as things are hardening a bit, like we're seeing like the, the physical payment systems now move over to chip uh, in the U.S. And so they're moving to more online, um, you know, fraud. Uh -huh. But I, I also think that's a catalyst to go to the ransomware because it is just easier to do. So, so, so Ziv, it's like yesterday's yesterday's crime kit guys or today's ransomware guys. It's not like they they specialize really early on. Like it's not like like an auto mechanic, right? And he's always an auto mechanic, right? right. Uh, the guy was an auto mechanic. Like the idea is like, you know, I used to sell this kind of malware. I used to be in this kind of business. And now I have evolved. Go ahead. Yeah, no. And as my peers uh, mentioned, uh, these guys just look for ways to monetize and make as much money as as, as as easily as they can. Yeah. Uh, they clearly identify the ransomware as a money machine. So they will keep using it as long as people would pay, and that's probably going to stay for a long time. Uh, but it's important to know that also the distribution mechanism they have really improved. Um, they need to distribute ransomware to as many people as possible, you know, to maximize their profits. And now that they have very excellent exploit kits out there, spamming botnets and other yes, tools, yes, yes. they have that easy way to, to reach the millions of people and, and get them infected. 
uh, uh, as, uh, to put forth an, uh, an alternate theory to like the payment system getting more secure, which could in fact be the case. Yeah. There's another one is that the hackers have been so plentiful and so successful at dumping credit card data and personal information on the web that they can't monetize it as easily. The prices it's, have gotten too it's, low. It's crash yeah. the market. It's so cheap. So when you look at the data that bad guys are encrypting, business data, personal data, who's going to pay more for your data than you? Yeah. That could be the other way to look mm -hmm. at it. Mm -hmm. it. The payment system and the identity system has done such a poor job that the bad guys can't monetize it anymore. Yeah. It's the other way to look yeah. at it. I mean, I mean risk, uh, I, uh, sorry, Chris, uh, is I called you risk. Uh, yeah. Chris, <laughs> is, is there a real name? Yeah, I like, <laughs> they call me risk. <laughs> I'll take you back to your loft days, right? Um, uh, you, you know, is there is there less inherent risk in encrypting data on on like a victim's systems than like exfiltrating that data? Well, I, I think the the, uh, the the risk that is is lowered is you don't have to extend yourself to another party. Uh, you don't have to extend yourself to the sort of the buyer's market, which is then going to monetize your your, your 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 PII or your credit card data and trust that relationship. Right, like you know, the victim is, you know who they are. Right, they're not law enforcement. They're 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 the victim. So I think it cuts out another level of of, of ambiguity and risk uh, out of the system to get it, you know, to get it from the victim. Yeah. So so there's a general criticism, and you you hear it in reports about the FBI. You hear it, uh, you know, kind of in whispers among security executives that that you know every time I pay out a ransom, I'm really fueling this criminal. Economy. I mean, is that is that an apt critique, right? I mean, it just seems pragmatic to me, right? Like, if I want my business to continue and I am a victim, it is much easier just to to kind of get these guys off my back. Of of course, they're right. Uh, every time you pay a criminal a ransom, it emboldens them. It fuels the market and innovation. But that is a philosophical question, a philosophical point of view. It is not realistic. Just like in kidnapping and ransom, when your data, when your loved ones are held hostage or your cargo ship is held hostage, you're going to pay. That is the only way it's going to work out, which is why that market exists. When your business is held down and held hostage, you're going to pay. So I completely empathize with the philosophical question. It is just not simply realistic to tell people, don't pay. It's just not going to work that way and it's short-sighted. For sure. Z Ziv, you look yeah, 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 I agree with Jeremiah, but I'd like to add that. Um, people have to remember that when they're infected with ransomware, it means they were infected. So they, were, they can be infected also with other malware. So never take it lightly. I mean, you need your fuzz back. Go ahead and you don't have a backup. Go and pay the ransom. But think hard what you need to do differently. How you want it to secure yeah. your networks. How do you want to secure computers? Because the next time it might not be ransomware. It might be a, a nasty backdoor or a bot that would be on your network. You've got to think yeah. hard about that. Chris? Well, you know, I obviously agree that, you know, this is, this, is, this is a stimulus for people to actually secure their systems or have, you know, good backups, right? Like, I think that's, that's going to be the outcome of someone who paid this ransomware, especially if they're a business, like a law firm or a hospital. They just can't get, keep getting hit over and over again. That's going to get too expensive. They're actually going to try to secure their systems. You know, wasn't there some, uh, some, like, ransomware good guys that were just infecting systems with a particular type of ransomware? That made you read like articles about security, right, Jeremiah? There's always the benevolent viruses in every particular market. Uh, what was it? Uh, there was Code Red, but there was also Code Blue back yeah. in the day yeah. that forced people to patch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Code Red. Bone. So you're going to see those things. They're going to be little microcosms, and but not the norm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that doesn't give us any telltale signs about how people on sort of the other side of things uh, are are sort of thinking about evolving, right? No, not really, because. Doing so is illegal, and the people doing that, they're kind of good Samaritans, and they're not going to extend themselves that far to commit a federal crime. Oh, for right sure, there. for sure. You know, kind of as a last question, I'm, I'm always really interested in how markets evolve, right? So, so just up and down the line, Ziv, we could start with you, right? Like, how do you think, you know, uh, this ransomware marketplace, the criminal marketplace, will continue to evolve in the future? Sure. So first of all, I think they will do whatever they can to get to more and more people around the world so they can get... In, uh, maximize the revenues. But they will look also into new ways to do that. For example, attack businesses. Yes. And attack organizations. They, this, this organization can pay, pay much bigger ransom than $300 or $500 that individuals pay. Yeah. Uh, the effort is bigger, but the bait is much higher, right? So I think they'll look into that most likely. Jeremiah? 
they're, yeah, they're, of course, they're going to ask for higher and higher ransoms, go after juicier and juicier targets, and then it's going to broaden out to far more than just the U.S. Right now, it's largely a U.S. phenomenon, yeah. only because that's probably the biggest and richest market, but it's not going to stay there much longer. So, so, so what, what industries, what, what, what segments haven't been hit yet? Uh, what haven't been hit is probably uh, energy would be one. Healthcare okay. only a little bit, but energy would be a big one. So I, I, I think it will get worse until it gets better. But I, I think like there's going to be a point where people wake up and say, like, um, you know, it's going to be a standard policy for a business to have an anti-ransomware strategy. Like, like, like people are going to be like, I'm not going to do business with you and, and unless, you know, or I'm not going to invest in your company or you're not going to be a partner unless you tell me, like, what, do you have that disaster recovery set? Yeah. Does it work? Are you doing all the things to keep from that happening? And that's going to take years to happen. Like, I don't think anyone has that. I actually heard in a panel talk today where um, they've, the uh, sort of, you know, the top 20 critical security controls, and there's like four that are really important. Well, um, someone's proposing adding two more, which are all about, you know, like, um, you know, destructive attacks and ransomware attacks to specifically mitigate those and sort of bump them up in the priority that security people should be thinking about. Yeah. So I think it is changing the landscape. We just change what we do very slowly, but uh, and it's going to be years before this starts to die down. But it will, I think. What I'm always amazed at, what I'm always amazed at, is uh, you know, kind of no matter the size of the company, there no one has really good disaster planning for security. Like no one is thinking. It's very expensive. Very, yeah, it's very expensive. There's not a lot of good long-term planning in security. Period. And. And you know, I I I'll, I'll fudge a little, right? I'll ask you guys, oh, why? Yeah. You know, why why isn't there, right? I, this doesn't have anything to do with ransomware. This is just something I'm really curious about. Uh, it's expensive. It's time consuming, and the benefit isn't immediate. You only see the value at the time of catastrophe. So it's what what happens, and of course it speaks to the market maturity. When someone has a heart attack, only after do they buy a good pair of running shoes and make the investment. Yeah. You'll find that the, those that have been uh, hit by ransomware one, two, three times, they're going to have the best disaster recovery plans in the business. Yeah. And that's what we get to look forward to. For sure. Yeah, the industry is incredibly reactive. You know, we, we all have wishful thinking it's not going to happen to us until it does, and then we realize it does, and then we, we, we plan for it. Well, but maybe uh, that's going to start We changing. have an infinite pool of victims, really. I mean, uh, <laughs> when you look at the individuals, uh, there are, what, 8 billion people around the world. Many of them still can pay. Um, they will keep infecting people. Um, ironically, it raises attention to the problem. Yeah. So uh, hopefully fewer and fewer people will pay in the future because they will have backups. And they will they have will plans. Be, they will have plans and they will patch their systems and do whatever they need uh, to minimize the risk. Just, just one important point about backups because that seems to be everybody's panacea exactly. about ransomware. It's not. It's only half the story. Because what happens is when you have a thousand endpoints that are infected, let's just pick that as a number, and IT says, yes, we have backups, yes, we can recover, and the business says, how long? And they say, a week. And if you have a hospital, a bank, a law firm, a week is too long. It's cheaper to pay the $50,000 ransom than recover. Yeah. So that's why you see a large majority of those that pay the ransom actually did have backups. Yeah. Well, listen, Jer gentlemen, this has, been, uh, this has been great for me. Thank you guys so much. And, and listen, thanks so much, Highwire PR. Uh, we really appreciate you. And that sort of concludes our live stream. That sort of includes our time together. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.